Hey, you're listening to the Road to a Billion podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Georgia, and I'm glad to have you with me here today. The Road to a Billion is a call-in radio show where you can ask me questions about freelancing, copywriting, entrepreneurship, mindset, scaling funnels, relationships, money, and more. The name of the show of the Road to a Billion is because I will have sold a billion dollars worth of stuff, my own and my clients, by the end of this year. And because my goal is to help a billion people in the next 10 years to make an impact on their lives, whether that's emotional, mental, or financial. We're going to start taking calls in about five minutes from now. And the way that works is people will take uh, their questions, put them into the Q&A section here on the Zoom webinar we're doing. And then Ed Ray will go through and answer, uh, well, select them, and then I'll answer them live with you. So before we go to that, I'm going to introduce you all to Ed Ray, who has an amazing monologue prepared. Here is Ed Ray. I'm Ed Ray, and I help people get Zuck Bucks by making their funnels uh, Facebook friendly and by following Facebook's ad policies so you don't get cucked by Zuck. There we go. Perfect. Somebody asked go. if I made you co-host, which I totally didn't do that either, but I just did it now. You just did. <laughs> New intro starts with, well, shit. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. shit. It's the road yeah. to billion. So Ed, <laughs> Ed is going to monologue about feeling deserving of massive wealth. This is a monologue he's been, you know, we just started recording. So uh, Ed's been preparing this monologue for a couple of weeks now. He's taken yeah. scrupulous notes and, and really studied yeah. really hard. Ed, I, I know you have a lot to say on this topic and I'm just really excited to hear it. So yeah, I'm really excited to present. Thank you. Actually, wow. uh, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, b before you just mentioned uh, that I had to do this monologue like a minute and a half ago, I, uh, <laughs> I, I did five weeks of extensive research on Warren Buffett and some of the world's richest, uh, you know, influencers. Yeah. So anyway, so, definitely, so <laughs> I thought you're going to segue into like a really cool point about that right away. No, but, I was totally okay. bullshitting. Um, okay, perfect. I could, I could, if it comes up, I could, but, uh, in terms of deserving massive wealth, one thing that I've learned over time, like from going from, you know, working for free, making zero money, grinding all the time to now, you know, charging, is there a bug on my shoulder? To now 1500 bucks an hour. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the one thing is like, if you, if you truly believe that you can help people and that you are willing to do what it takes to help people, you are deserving of wealth. Um, Cause at the end of the day, like wealth is just, what you're able to give to people, you're able to solve problems. The more problems and the bigger problems you can solve, the more wealth you can create. So when you're first starting, you can only solve small problems. So if you're a copywriter, you're just like, hey, I wrote an email for you. That doesn't solve a massive problem necessarily, but it solves a problem, AKA not necessarily having an email to send. That's money making skill. So by being able to solve more and bigger problems for people, the more deserving you are for wealth and the more you can charge. When I was 17, I was charging 250 bucks an hour. Now I charge, I'm 20, I charge 1500 an hour. Why is that? Because I can solve bigger problems. And when you can actually help people and you can see in the world that you are making a difference, you are helping people, you are getting results for your clients, you're getting results for yourself and you're impacting people, that's what's gonna allow you to charge more and you even feel more deserving by seeing that people get great results from you like the fact that i was able to you know take a funnel for my client that had a really hard time on facebook so they got up to about a million and then they got shut down i come in you know this old i only charge 10k for it which i totally undercharged um but i helped them get, get it back up and now they're back up and running and you know, they're scaling up to hitting a million bucks a month now from one product. So that level of confidence, you can't really shake that because you have such great results. And when you can get your clients such great results, you go, hey, you know what? Like if I can get this person such great results, you know, I can't help but be able to charge more. I can't help but be able to deserve more because the more that people pay you, the more you can give them. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize is by charging more and by giving like better results to your clients, by giving more of your time to your clients and more of your effort and your energy, you can get them better results. You're not stealing from them by charging more. You're not stealing from them by charging what you are worth and what you deserve. You've just been undercharging the whole time. 
and now you're finally charging what you're worth. Stefan? No, I mean, you're killing it. You had a pregnant pause and I thought maybe that was the end. So I was about to come in, you know, yeah, but I didn't ahead. mean to interrupt you on your pregnant pause. No, I mean, you're completely right, man. I love this. This is so good. Um, I was going to say for everyone who's in the Justin and Stefan talk Facebook, <laughs> talk Facebook, Justin and <laughs> Stefan talk copy Facebook, Facebook group. group. Um, uh, if you look at Matias Missouri's post, how to get more copywriting jobs, he's literally interviewed over 150 copywriters in the last two weeks. He's hiring an absurd amount something like 50, I think he hired a like 50 plus copywriters recently, Including he did 50 plus one-on-one -on -one interviews. Did he hire you too? Mm -hmm. Dude, he's, he's out of control. He's like a crazy hiring spree. And by the way, not to plug old RMBC method, but he said on our call too, he was like 80% of the people I've hired, like at least were trained on RMBC because it just sets them apart like hardcore. So that was dope to hear. Um, but yeah, read his post if you haven't looked at that yet. Cause he like, uh, he breaks down a lot of stuff, but one of the, Again, the attitude and work ethic, but he talks about, um, where's the one here? It's like, uh, basically talks about confidence, right? Like that's the one I'm trying to look for. Um, there's the idea of like, even like, um, like everything gets noticed, but even your tonality when they press you on your copyright knowledge, things like that. It's like having that confidence, like when you, when you talk and, and believing yourself and like just all these little things, like I, that was my favorite of all his points, you know? He said, you know, hiring managers and CEOs read posts, even if we don't comment, we see who is active and who isn't. We see who contributes, who doesn't. We see how you format your email, your font size, your font choices, how you send in your work. We notice the words you use while applying. We notice if you are two minutes early on your Zoom interview or five minutes late. I run an eight-figure digital marketing agency that owns several brands in info, publishing, e-commerce, a team of 40 plus great people and media buyers. I've interviewed thousands of people for all types of positions over the last 15 years and hired hundreds of, peop hundreds of people. We noticed your tonality when we press you on your copyright knowledge or if you've written the entire sales page you're showing us or if you just took someone else's work and changed the headline uh, color and passing it as your own. Be honest and open because we notice everything and we will always hire hunger and honesty rather than someone trying to appear more experienced than you are. So I just like that, like that, to me was so cool and it kind of ties into what you're saying here because like yeah you saw bigger problems but even earlier on too it's like having like confidence and assuredness in yourself and like even the tone which you present yourself and how you present yourself is just so important and so vital so i wanted to add that because i just love this post from matthias like i want to print it out and put it on my wall and i'm not even <laughs> i'm not trying to get hired as a copywriter but it was like so much gold there so um but yeah. Ed, that was that was an awesome uh awesome opening monologue i'm so glad i gave you the last month to prepare for that thanks man. thanks man yeah really really nailed it um with that being said should we hop in and like answer some questions oh yeah oh yeah let's get oh, to yeah. it yeah so oh we have a great question here from Ludfi. Ludfi asks hey stefan just bought my ticket to the coffee accelerator virtual live event great nice. work i'll see you there can't wait to meet all the awesome people there my question is, if my goal is to get clients there, what's the best way for me to prepare besides watching the videos in the Copy Accelerator members area? What's up, Luffy? That's a great question. How you doing? Hey, hi, Stefan. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, Ed. Yo, yo. I thought yo, you were yeah. just going to do that, that, uh, that hat like, uh, tip because you kind of tipped your hat. Maybe you were just adjusting it, but it looked like you were just doing a, like, a tip of the hat to Luffy. And I was like, that's classy as fuck. <laughs> 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 like this is like uh luffy sorry man but go go on yeah so you're you're wondering about how to you know best kind of leverage getting new copywriting uh, well networking and getting new opportunities uh as part of the event right yeah so i'm like a media buyer and copywriter so i'm just wondering like what's the best approach for me to get gigs from the event yeah great question so things i would do i would be, as we as you look at the attendee list, which we will like publish and you'll you'll have access to, and I'd be make sure you Facebook friend like everybody who's attending because that'll be both copy you know accelerator members uh, as well as um, members who are like our people who bought tickets. We've we've got seventy four applications so far, and we've had thirty people buy tickets. I think actually Gurleen was the most recent one. You were number twenty nine. Gurleen was thirty one. Siraj was thirty. Uh, Svetslav was 28. I could go off the whole list. Lucas Mills is on there. A um, bunch of people. But anyway, uh, so, but I would go through and like make sure you're, you're adding everybody on front on Facebook. You can even send them a message and be like, hey, you know, really excited to be at this event, spending time with you. Um, you know, I'm Luffy. You can, I mean, 
just leverage me, right? You do, you do stuff and help me out. Um, so like I'd be, you know, mentioning that quite a bit. Um, and then I'd be active, be active in the chats, participating, like sharing insights and things like that. Um, I think that's really helpful too. Um, and then, you know, take advantage of the networking rooms that we're going to have, cause we're going to have like, uh, you know, two different breakout sessions, uh, each of the two days. So we're going to have the different business owners, uh, who will be in their own zoom room who are looking to hire copywriters. And then the freelancers can come into those different rooms, have face to face time, like meet them, talk to them, and then just have a relentless follow up with everybody you meet, like follow, um, you know, sending them emails or messages and stuff like that. Those are my most immediate thoughts. Ed, do you have stuff to add to that? Uh, as someone who, you know, has networked and gotten clients? Yeah. Um, well, like you said, add everybody in the copy slider Facebook group, literally just add them and just talk to all of them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, do your, do your research on them also. Okay. I'm sorry, jazz. You're going to hate me for sharing this secret, but here it is. Um, so I, I told jazz, uh, a, a similar, uh, method. Uh, this is pretty sneaky. I like to think. So what it is, is, uh, so now that you're in the, uh, copy start, cause they're in part of copy starter light when they, uh, buy the virtual event, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anytime you see somebody who is an offer owner, who's like posting up their copy for review, um, like their sales letter, like, Hey, you know, my, I wrote this or my, like, you know, my internal staff wrote this or something. It's like, Hey, there's a new offer for one of my, you know, products, our new letter. You look at the copy and you you know, if that's the kind of client that you want, like if that's the industry and vertical you want, you now have a sales letter before it's launched. So you write three emails promoting that sales letter and you send it to that person who's in the group. You say, Hey, I saw you're, you know, doing this sales letter for your new offer. I just wrote you three emails to launch it with done. That's, that's a super good strategy. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good strategy by the way i am this is not webinar light but i'm putting the link in for the sales page if you want to attend the virtual event um that's where you can go apply to do it um and that's a fucking gangster strategy yeah like um like michael roshin because when he when he because when you when you uh get a ticket for this virtual event which is september 10th and 11th uh you get, yeah, you get access to copy started light, which means you're in the Facebook group. You get access to all of the trainings, you get all this stuff. Um, Michael Roshin, who's obviously a copy starter member now and went from not being able to put presents under the Christmas tree to making 10, 12, $15,000 a month. Um, like Michael, you know, he's on the call here and he's in the chat and he can speak to this too. Uh, I was talking with him cause before there's a story about how he was pacing the hall the first day of the event. And I found him, stopped him and dragged him back in and forced him to actually, you know, be present. Um, but even before that, I got a call with Michael cause he was having, you know, he was anxious about the event and worried about, did he belong? And then after that call, I was looking at Michael and I was looking at our mutual friends and we had like 10 mutual friends and I like literally messaged Michael, do you remember this? I messaged you and I like, yelled at you and I got, like basically cussed you out. And I was like, Michael, like, what are you doing? Like you're in the copy accelerator group. Now you need to go in and add every single one of the people who's in this copy accelerator group as a friend. If like, if I don't see that our mutual friends are just growing dramatically um then like i'm gonna be really 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 pissed at you and to michael's credit the next day we had like 70 mutual friends and we had like 100 mutual friends um but he like yeah he hadn't taken advantage of that at first because i think he had that you know imposter syndrome and, and those fears we have uh but yeah especially in the copy accelerator group which again you get there's 206 people not including the light members or not sorry not including the people who bought a ticket for the event in that facebook group um and that's like 206 people where half of them are really high end copywriters who, by the way, are probably looking to outsource work a lot of the time. And then the other half are all business owners who are hiring copywriters all the time. Like, you know, Matias who posted, he's in copy accelerator, right? All these people are, so adding all this folks saying hi, telling them that you bought, you know, um, a ticket to the event, you're excited to go. Like they're all like really supportive. I mean, you guys saw a lot of you saw Matt Martinez in um, copy accelerator light that he joined copy accelerator light. And he posted about that in Justin and Stefan, talk copy and like so many people were from copy accelerator like members of copy accelerator were coming in like boom great job great decision welcome man like we're a very inclusive welcoming group i mean i can think of the top of my head like maybe there's like three to five people like if you message nick daniel and you're like hey bro just join copy accelerator light i'm not going to tell you that nick daniel's gonna be like sick I'm, I'm rooting for you and then like hire you to do a bunch of stuff for v shred i mean he might 
but the vast majority of people, um, you know, will. And then add back to your whole thing about Mario Castelli. What's up, bro? By the way, speaking of like some of the best copywriters on the planet. Um, but yeah, that was a great, great strategy, Ed. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. By the way, Mario is the one who wrote that sales letter that I posted. Mario, like I got to talk to you, Mario. Cause like I, for all the stuff I'm doing, I just sort of, I need you in my life more. He's booked up. That's why no one hears about Mario. Cause he's just like writing killer sales letters all the time. But like, I don't know who's better at like, you know, biz op event type sales letters than Mario is like legitimately he's the best I've seen at it. I mean, Ed, you're really good at it too, but you do other stuff. But Mario is just like such a grinding beast at like these sales letters. So huge Mario love. And yes, time to add Mario on Facebook. I would do that for sure. Seriously, Mario is so behind the scenes. Even Mario, at the first event in Austin, you were like not that outspoken and you left with like eight or nine clients or something ridiculous like that. And then you ended up like being super busy from that point on. But anyway, I'm rambling. I'm going to shut up. We're going to answer another question. Luffy, was that helpful? Um, yeah, so just I wanted to recap. Um, basically, it's just <laughs> adding people on Facebook and messaging them and then being active in the chats, the network king rooms and the breakout sessions and then follow up emails and messages and do research on them yeah that's a big part of it i mean doing the active emails um and then luffy so because luffy helps me with um this show he like comes in and does um he does like the uh, fascinations on youtube and stuff like that so like on top of all this stuff like luffy i mean leverage that fact you know what i mean like i would be telling people how you're writing stuff for me. You're part of my team. You're helping. Like I, you know, I'll give you, happily give you an endorsement. So I think that'll help you too. I'm sure. I'm just wondering, like, should I like come up with like a positioning for myself? You know what I mean? Like how Ed is like a Facebook compliance expert. Should I like come up with a positioning for myself? Do you feel like you have that a positioning for yourself right now? I mean, what do you think you're the best at? Mm, I mean, my experience is mostly in running Facebook um, ads and Google ads as well as YouTube ads. And I write a lot of Facebook ad copy as well. So more on like the traffic side and some short form copy. Yeah, I would focus on that. I think it's fair to be like, I'm, you know, that's an area of my specialty. Like it's an experience. I've got a lot of experience here. Um, Cause there's a lot of people who need help with ad copy right now. So I think that's a totally uh, good way to, to approach it. Okay, cool. Thanks, Stefan. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, I took off my headset because I felt like I felt like my my voice was like echoey. I didn't like it, so I said like, oh, you know, gotcha. screw it, man. Coming, coming in hot. Yes, sir. Yo, by the way, Stefan, I, uh, I think we should. I mean, this is my idea, but I think it'd be cool if we take that section and we we put it into the uh, copy center light. Say, hey, here's how to prepare for the event. Yeah. It's a great idea. Let's do and that. Also, and put it in the uh, copy seller light uh, members area. So here's how to get clients from copy seller. Make that as a value addition. It's true. Although now anyone who shares a new sales letter is going to get like a hundred emails because every single person. What's so bad about that though? Yeah, I agree. I mean, that wouldn't bother me. Um, yeah, Mario, by the way, too, he said, it's true. I had some crazy vertigo going on at the first event. I barely even talked to people. And yeah, I still got a bunch of clients. You have to spe uh, specifically try not to find clients at the event if you want to yeah, get hired. Well, that's true. Love that. You have to insult them directly if you don't want clients. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, and don't do that. Don't um, do that. Nice. Jagadish um, said, it's my first time here. I've been watching all the podcasts for the last month. You give out a shit ton of value. Kudos to you guys. Thanks, Jagadish. Thanks, bro. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Cool. Um, so next, yeah. are you ready for the next question? Oh, I'm yeah, ready, yeah. man. Ready for the next question. Good. Let's go. For a newbie copywriter who wants to burn the bridge in the next 90 days, disappear to focus on the craft and go all in to be a good copywriter, having the right mindset and skill set, what would you suggest his daily routine taking the necessary required action looks like to achieve the required outcome? From Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. What's up, buddy? Hold on. Okay. For some reason, it's not letting me allow him to talk. Oh, no. That's really weird. I'm literally pressing the allow to talk button. By the way, on Facebook Live, what's up, Danielle Porter? I see you. Said, yeah, I'd love to see your face. Oh. Mac Kamara is here. What's up, Mac, on Facebook Live? I'm still co-host. I should be able to, you know, unmute Zachy. is being silly right now. I'm sorry. I don't know why it's not working, but I guess we can just answer it. Okay. Sorry, Zach is, But, yeah, so I want to burn the bridge, and then you marked it as answered. Um. Sorry, here. 
we get back to this. Uh, disappear to focus on the craft and go all in. Be good at copywriting, having the right mindset and skill set. Basically, daily routine for to be a good copywriter, fast AF. Yeah, I mean the big things I would say, like if you haven't gotten, I hate like I mean, I hate the answer of being like study my stuff or buy my course or whatever it is, but like the RMBC method really is like the shortcut to writing better copy in less time. Um, and again, there's like a free version of it on my website where I kind of break it down. It's not like obviously nearly as in depth as like the actual courses. Um, but I would try to invest in the RMBC method if possible, or at least study it. Um, what's up, Justin Lucas? Uh, I think that's really important. Yeah. You know, we've talked about a combination too of like studying, but then also doing right. So a blend of, of studying copy. Like we, we talk about looking at sales letters, writing them by hand, um, looking at what's working now watching like a VSL every day, that type of stuff. Um, but then I would also be practicing writing copy. And I would talk, we've talked about this before, where even if you want to write copy for dream clients, whether it's sales letters or email creatives or Facebook ads or whatever it is, um, like take time to do that, practice your chops, but you know, do it based on like a structure, right? Like, like based on use RMBC or my outline or whatever, again, the free resource, if you're not going to do the, um, buy the course right now or whatever, but like, follow that process, practice with it. And then, cause then not only are you getting the practice in, but then use like create your LinkedIn, you know, if you don't have that, that you're like a copy on LinkedIn and then take the content you're creating there. Right. And like share it on LinkedIn. So if you write sales letters or emails or sales copy, or if you do like, um, if you want to do like funnel critiques where you go through funnels and like make suggestions on how to optimize the checkout page or like headline tweaks, like you can then take like the stuff you're practicing record yourself doing that and put it as content on LinkedIn or share it on Facebook or share it other places. So now like you're actually marketing yourself while you practice. Um, and that I think really helps a lot too. Cause like the big thing is like getting better is important and practicing is important, but if you can do that while marketing and getting your name out there at the same time and like posting regularly joining Facebook groups, I think, you know, those two go hand in hand. It's like, I, you know, for me, I wrote my first, I decided I wanted to be a copywriter on like a, you know, a Wednesday night in 2012. Asked Laura, hey, do you think I can be a copywriter? She said, yeah. Put up a sales letter and had two new clients the next day. So it wasn't like I was like, I think some copywriters take all like, oh, I got to study for three months, four months, five months before I can you know, become a copywriter. I don't think that's true. I don't think you should have expectations of going out and getting some huge, you know, big fish or whatever um, necessarily. But I think you can start going after clients early on. But even if you aren't getting clients, just like I said, re like do the copy anyway, build up a portfolio because that'll make it easier to get clients. You're practicing. It's an investment in yourself and then repurpose that content, share it on different social platforms as posting and things like that. So you start to get yourself recognized. Um, yeah. Sumama, uh, Sumama said regular LinkedIn posting got me my first client. So yeah, it works as long as you stick to it. And that's an important thing too, sticking with it. Rachel said, Stefan, would you share a copy written for a paid client? As far as what I share that on LinkedIn, um, I would have to get my, like my client's permission to do that, but you could also case study or you could show like a headline or a few little things. Like I really like just posting stuff like, Oh, you know, my client, here's like the three headlines I had for my client. Here's like how I wrote them. And then like, based on that, I was thinking, you know, which one's gonna do the best. Well, here, I decided to, to give them all three to test, but this is the one I think will be the winner. Here's why here's the thought process I put into it. It uses these direct response, like, uh, principles, blah, blah, blah. And then like create content that way. So sharing a little tidbit of it is cool. I wouldn't necessarily do a full explication or breakdown of something that a client paid you for, unless the client gives you permission. Ed Ray, anything to, to add to that? Nah, dude, you crushed it. Uh, I think it's literally just, um, also my, my go-to is always the pick somebody you want to write for, um, that, you know, is currently running emails and then just write emails for them and send, send it to them. If they use it, great. And then they pay you eventually. And if they don't use it, you have more for your portfolio. It's that simple. For sure. And um, somebody on Facebook Live, who was it? Nate Pierce said, did you drive traffic to that sales letter for your skills? Um, I didn't. I just posted that one on uh, Warrior Form. I didn't know how to drive traffic, which by the way, I don't know, you know, is Warrior Form, it's still active. I don't know if like, people if they still have warriors for hire or if there's like other forms that are better now but i mean i literally just posted like a warrior for hire thing on uh warrior form and that's where i got hired i'm looking at warrior form right now which has got uh conversion rate copywriting i wonder if they still have a jobs board joint ventures 
Oh, you have to explore and look and see if we're from, yep. You can still post there and get some traffic. Cool. Um, but yeah, so that, those are the main things I would be doing. But again, I think the whole big thing is like, um, you have to wait to get a client. I don't think really, as long as you're like studying and you're devoted and like, then also, um, yeah, I mean, just be like, just be active, be writing, create your own portfolio is one of the most important things. Like that drives me crazy when freelancers are like, I can't get hired because I don't have a portfolio. And it's like, well, then create your own fucking portfolio. Like it's the simplest thing. Like, why are you waiting for somebody to pay you to make your portfolio? Just make the portfolio yourself. That's a simple, that's a total mental block BS self-limiting thing that you're doing subconsciously to like stop yourself from getting clients and succeeding. Um, so just create a portfolio yourself. Like that's a no brainer. That's, that's, there's no excuse. Um, girling, what's the best way to make one? pick clients you want to write for and then do like create emails, write sales letters, you know, do things like that for them. But yeah. Uh, Ed Ray, more Q and A's please. All right. Next question from Aldrin. Aldrin asks, what are your takeaways with your meeting with Brian Kurtz? Nice. What's up Aldrin? How you doing? Good. Um, can you hear me? You were a little cut off for a second. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Perfect. Every time, man, every time I see your picture, I want to go back to school. <laughs> um, yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, um, I, th I think that you had a meeting with Brian Kirst, but for, uh, for a reason you weren't able to have that meeting because of, I think it was energy issues or electricity issues, something like that. But I'm um, just curious of what are your key takeaways with your meeting with the man? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, so one thing, by the way, cool. You know, Brian's going to come on and co-host Road to a Billion with me on, let me get the date right, Thursday, October 1st. So on Thursday, October 1st, it'll be me, Ed Ray, and Brian Kurtz all answering your questions, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm really stoked about that. And actually also Amber Spears, who's a speaker at the uh, upcoming Virtual Women Copy Accelerator is going to co-host with me on the something, September 3rd. So we got some cool co-hosters coming up. I'm pretty, pretty stoked about that. Um, but as far as like the, the takeaways from the conversation with Brian, uh, there was a lot. I mean, there was a there's some, a lot of validation, which is always helpful, you know, because like I'm sharing a lot of my ideas and plans and goals. And when you hear that, you know, Brian saying like, oh yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, like that is uh, really validating and helpful. So for example, one of my plans and I actually posted in the copy accelerator group about this yesterday is after uh, the virtual event in like late October, early November, I'm going to go on tour. I've talked about this a little bit on my email list. So I'm basically going to charter a private jet and I'm going to fly, I'm going to do San Diego, Las Vegas, probably Oregon, maybe Eugene, because people are saying Eugene's better than Portland. I don't know. I'm not trying to get into that debate, just saying. Um, like Park City slash Eden, Utah, uh, then Houston, Austin, Chicago, New York, uh, and then probably like Tampa, Florida. And I'm going to go to all these different cities with like my family and my assistant, Jude, doing the film stuff. And at all these different um, cities, we're going to do like two, I'm going to do like a, a, a private, like one day mastermind for copy accelerator members who come to those places. So like including Tampa, there's a lot of people calling out for North Carolina. It's possible. I'm going to hit North Carolina too. Um, but I'm going to go and do like, yo, I'm bringing the, since, we, since, we're doing, since we're doing virtual, I'm going to bring the mastermind to our members, right? Um, as much as I can. So I think that's really cool. And I'll film content for it. And uh, then on top of that, I'm going to do a second day, probably that's like open to like maybe the public or like, you know, that's a little bit less formal. Um, but I shared that with Brian and he was like, that's a really fucking good idea. And I was like, thanks, man. And I mean, you know, I'm going to spend probably $150,000, $200,000 on that. Um, Cause I'm, you know, you're turns out flying around the country on a private jet's expensive and then Airbnbs and then finding locations. Uh, but, you know, it was cool telling it to Brian and Brian was like, um, just immediately got it. And he's like, yeah, he's like, but really that's not that much money for like the ROI that that brings. I mean, all the people in your mastermind, you're building those relationships with them, like the networks you're building, all this kind of stuff. And it was like, so it's cool having Brian validate that. Um, by the way, another cool thing I'm gonna do for that, I just had this idea yesterday is I'm gonna do a contest too, where somebody can like basically 
one person can win like the chance to come on the jet with me and my my team and family and like as we fly around and do this so i'm gonna do a contest where it's probably someone who can help with social media and then basically i'll put a thing up where it's like hey come on like you know join my email list make sure you like you know like me on instagram and share this stuff and they'll do things to get the like to help it go kind of viral but they'll let people like all come in and apply and then we'll pick one person who starts with us in san diego and literally is on the plane just traveling with me and my family for two weeks going to all these masterminds doing all this stuff um and then like on top of that it'll be a sick i think it's good from it'll be a cool experience for somebody but it's also really cool like pr right because then if like i um for my pr team having this whole thing of like you know this entrepreneur wants to give you the chance to like get on a private jet and fly around the country with him as he like meets with other hundreds of other you know entrepreneurs and marketers and stuff and like whatever we'll figure out the exact phrasing so it's better than that but i think i can make that go pretty viral like here's your chance to go fly around the country on a private jet with like a you know multi-million dollar entrepreneur um i think we can make that go super viral so even that alone it's like okay yeah it's going to cost me 200,000 250,000 whatever it's going to cost me to do this but like even just from that like pr exposure i can probably generate and then all the people that will then get on my email list and do those other things um you know it pays for the roi is going to be there like 10 or 20 times or over but um anyway but ryan back to the actual question from Aldrin. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was cool, you know, because Brian was like, I didn't have that contest idea yet, but Brian was like, that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. Um, we also talked about like ascension models versus dissension models um, and how I kind of often will do these dissension models, um, which is like starting with like Copy Accelerator, which is now 36000 a year for the full membership. And we're actually going to raise it to 45000 a year. It's like cool. But starting at the event, it's going to be 45000 a year um, unless you're already on the waiting list. So one of the reasons why joining Copy Accelerator Lite is cool, um, right? But then I did like the uh, RMBC method, which is 997. Um, and then I did RMBC Applied, which is what well, was $97 a month and now it's 197 a month. Um, but how I like to do these Ascension models where I start with like these big high ticket things, but then I actually work backwards. Whereas a lot of other people will come in and do an Ascension model where they start with the low ticket and work up to the high ticket. I kind of prefer starting with high ticket stuff and working backwards. So that's the Descension model working down versus an Ascension model that's moving up. Um, and Brian's the one who kind of pointed out that I do that, which was a cool kind of observation because I was like, oh yeah, you're right. I do like this Ascension model more than an Ascension model. Um, for the publishing company that I'm working on, which I wanted to stress test with him and see his thoughts, and he overall really liked it. We talked about you know, finding somebody who can, one of his big pieces of advice was like, hey, make sure you are, um, you, know, you need somebody to really run that for you or you're going to, have like stress on your bandwidth really fast you should find somebody who's you know, has experience who's already done it and i talked about somebody who i thought about maybe having to really help to run it and they're like but that person is doing a bunch of other stuff and brian brian's advice was well basically it was like what can you what would you have to pay that person to get them to only do this one thing for you like so his idea which i love that mind mindset too it wasn't like oh this guy's doing other stuff so i guess we can't work with him it was like coming to that person being like what would it take right to have you uh, work like just on my stuff exclusively and he talked about how when um with boardroom they would do the same thing where they're like who's like the best in the road at whatever it is we need and say so do a list and maybe it was like um you know, like mark ford or it was like david deutsch or whoever it was and um sometimes they were able to get that person sometimes they weren't but if they had that like archetype of like who my dream person is then as i go to look for other people uh like you can match their characteristics with the characteristics of your your dream person i thought that was really cool um, way to think about when you're hiring folks, like think about who's the best in the road at like whatever it is you want. And then like, can you get them? And if you can't, what are their characteristics? And then how do I match whoever I'm hiring, to make sure their characteristics match that person. So that was a bunch of those takeaways. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Algene. Glad I could share. Um, Ed, let's do more. Let's do more. Next one is from, oh, I lost it. Oh Here my gosh. Jazz. Jazz asks, how do you stay hungry at higher levels of, su of success? Because I know as you get more successful, it gets more comfortable and people lose their hunger. So how do you keep the hunger you had early on long-term? Good question. What's up, Jazz? Yo, what's up, Stefan? What's up, man? Yeah, that's a, I want to take preventative measures. So that's, that's basically my question. How do you keep that hunger that you had on day one? Yeah, there's a couple of things for me. Um, 
you know, one is like, I mean, there was a period for me where it was um, just taking pride in being the best. Like, I, I one thing I would do, and I've, I've, this has changed a little bit to today, so I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to talk about what my answer was like a year or two ago and what my answer is today. So a year or two ago, it was like thinking about someone like, it's funny because I don't like Tom Brady or the Patriots. Like, I'm not like a, I'm not a Patriots fan. But as an example, right, thinking about um, like Tom Brady with football, right? Like, this guy wants to be the best every day. He doesn't show up to practice and half-ass it. Um, he's not sort of like phoning it in. And thinking about these top, like, high-performance, like, athletes, that they're bringing it every day to practice and they're bringing it to every single game. And I sort of, like, for me, it works. And it was, like, a fun game to imagine myself as, like, you know, the Tom Brady of, like, copywriting. So I'm like, you know, am I going to – bring it every day am I gonna be the best or am I gonna half ass it and phone it in and I thought about how these other top performers don't do it and that was kind of a fun motivational trick um the bigger answer for me though today is attaching what you're doing to like a why because like even though you know making lots of money is awesome and it, it never stops being awesome but you get used to it but what I look at like a lot of the money that I make as just like giving me it's literally just like a like like little so every dollar is like a little soldier for me to deploy, you know? So like, I'm just reinvesting a ton of the money I make. I have a very like nonchalant attitude about money, honestly, sometimes to my detriment, although somehow I've managed to like square, you know, square away a good amount. But, um, like talking about this, this private jet thing, it's like, Oh, that's gonna be sick. I can rent a charter, charter a jet, fly around the country, meet all these people, have these amazing experiences, take my family, create this content, and like that motivates me. That's like, you know, 250 grand is like a good amount of money, right? So I'm like, but I want to do it. And I, I can do it now, but it'll be even easier to do it as money keeps flowing in and all these things happen. So to me, like knowing that I've got these cool goals that are attached to what I'm doing and that they take money, that makes me more motivated to be like crushing it, making money so I can continue to do more unique things. And ultimately it's attached to that why of trying to reach, you know, a billion people, make an impact on their lives, which means really having to put myself out there a ton and whether that's like through PR or, uh, you know, doing stuff on events and, 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 you know, upping my Instagram game and, and, and all that. Plus I need to be good at what I'm doing cause I'm not a master of what I'm doing and I'm teaching this stuff, but I'm like, I fall off and I'm not good at it. Then I don't think people should need to listen to me. I need to be authentically, you know, teaching stuff that I'm really good at and being authentic with it. So I want to stay on point with all that stuff too. So, um, you know, short term, like there's fun little mental tricks, but really if you attach it to a why and you focus less on the money and more on what the money will accomplish, allow you to accomplish what it lets you to do, um, that's a really good way to stay motivated because I'm not excited about making another whatever it is, you know, a couple hundred grand or a million dollars. I mean, that sounds fucking crazy and I get it, right? Um, but there's a time where I was for sure because it's, it, it, but that, that I, I promise you it, it, it wears off surprisingly fast. Um, it really does. And I've had, and so many people gave me that advice who were way ahead of me early on and they talked about it and I, um, kind of was like, okay, yeah, easy for you to say, you know, wait till I'm making that kind of money. And then I made that kind of money and it wasn't great. And I spent it on dumb stuff and whatever, but then it does fade off. I'd rather be making that money than not making it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but like the novelty of just making money for money's sake is really, it's a novelty and it's something that's very fleeting and short. Um, like, you know, sh short lasting or whatever, but um, changing people's lives, like doing unique things, like doing things that nobody else can do, right? Like the fact that I can, I can do that. I can charter this jet and travel the country and meet with people and help them. I mean, it's so sick. By the way, Ryan Skelly, just like the video, Ryan Skelly, I gave you a shout out last video. You probably didn't see it. Congratulations on um, being pregnant or, you know, having a, having a baby on the way. Um, but yeah, that, that's my main answer, Jazz. Does that help? Yeah, the house on a lot. That's it's really, really deep. Good man. Good man. Ed, do you have anything you want to add to that? I know you know you're uh, you're earlier on in your journey, but you're having a lot of success. Have you thought about that as far as staying hungry? Um, Dude, honestly, I, frankly, I have a bit of a hard time with that sometimes. Um, full transparency. Uh, I'm, I'm I've been doing a lot of self work lately and diving deep into why I do what I do, and I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> Right now, I'm just, you know, like my, my biggest goal is to move out and live in my own place. That's like my biggest goal. Um, but other than that, I don't have a huge why right now. And I think that's okay. Because you're not always going to know exactly why you're doing what you're doing as long as you just keep doing it um, and just do the self work to eventually figure it out until 
your why is complete or until you know you find a bigger why that is even bigger and better and pushes you further yeah it, make, it makes sense one thing i'll say to you about the why's is that i will often meet people who get burned out who don't have a why but i rarely meet people who are burned out who do have a why that doesn't mean it's, it doesn't you know it's not like a, a perfect law like but Generally, those of a why, it's a lot easier to have the energy and the motivation and things like that because you have that purpose behind what you're doing. And then if you don't have it and you're just sort of doing stuff, but you're not, yeah, you know, we all want a vision towards the future. But I, I agree that, Ed, it's okay that you don't have one at this moment because there, it takes time to find your why. Um, I don't think it's like you go to the, the why store and then somebody just sort of like gives you a sticker with your why on it and you're like, yay. Um, but I do think thinking about those bigger goals, those bigger dreams, those bigger purposes, and, and, um, you know, it really, it does help a lot. So yeah. Sweet. Jazz, I'm glad that, uh, glad that helped. Cool. Next up from, oh, damn, he left. All right. Kimmy also left. I know. Can we, I mean, what I could still do that. Can we do? There we go. So do there we it. Go. Yeah. Okay. Michael McGovern has a really good question here. Um, Michael says, Hey guys, in the freelancer course, Ian, Ian Stanley, for those who don't know, talks about starting in chaos and then moving towards more focus as you, you know, get better. How do you balance certain times in your life when you embrace controlled chaos, like meeting new people, exploring new opportunities versus laser focus on a specific goal. So working in solitude and ignoring distractions, et cetera. It's a really good question. It's a really good question. What's up, Michael? How are you? Hey guys, what's up? I'll guess. What's up? Here good. you go. Yeah, that's a good question. So what are you working on right now? What are your goals? Well, I, I'm, I want to get to uh, a consistent retainer deals uh, for copywriting. Um, I've been doing a lot of project-based work. Um, and uh, so, but now I want to kind of um, maybe take some of the existing relationships I have and create some new ones that are a little more long-term uh, and uh, so that I can kind of build a little more consistently. Got it. Yeah. And Ian, so I loved his, his chaos stuff when he did it at the live event we did. And then I was rewatching it in the freelancer freedom, um, course. And it was like, I took like a ton of notes on it cause I, I loved it. So for those of you who are watching, who don't kind of know what Ian's whole idea, I mean, to paraphrase it and obviously I'm not Ian, um, I don't have the accent or the, the chiseled jawline, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's like, there's times where when you're like starting a new venture, um, or you're, you know, doing a new in, endeavor, um, like embracing chaos and, and, and exposing, it's almost like a chaos funnel, right? And like early on, like you want to be ex more exposure to chaos because you just never know, like there's these weird cosmic ping balls, ping, pinballs that are bouncing around and you don't know what's going to hit what. And then sort of as you achieve like more focus or mastery on something, or as you're starting to get results, like um, you can start to kind of narrow it down more. So for like saying like what you're doing, Michael, um, you know, I'd look at it like, uh, going to different events. I mean, events are hard to go to right now, but like, you know, going to events, like posting in groups, being exposed to a lot of people makes sense because right now you're trying to, um, you know, get these retainer clients. So the more exposure, the better, right? You want your pinball bouncing around and hitting more stuff. Um, as you start getting more of those retainer clients and you don't, then you can limit your exposure to chaos more for the time being. And I think that's when I would then you start focusing and going deeper on actually the fulfillment of the work. Um, so I think first is getting the work and that's more of the chaos side. And then I think you start narrowing down and limiting the chaos as you actually do the fulfillment of that work. Um, that's the way I would approach it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, yeah, man. I love that. I, I love, I love that stuff about chaos. So, um, has yeah. the course been helpful overall for you so far? Yeah. Yeah. I picked up a, a couple of good things. Um, excellent it's uh yeah it's, it's especially your guys um recorded uh event was was some awesome stuff in there um yeah it's interesting it's a, and and then i also see what you guys were talking about with um wanting to have something that appeals to different types of people because i felt like i kind of in the like i've been at this you know at the whole entrepreneurship thing for about two years and i think earlier on it was more wide and then i got super super focused but then i kind of realized i didn't really fit my personality like I love to be you know talking to people and networking and you know sharing ideas and stuff like that so um 
So it's cool that you guys have like different uh, approaches to different types of people. And then, you know, m my challenge is just kind of settling into, you know, what's good, what fits right for me. Um, and, you know, what, what, what do I think is right for me versus like, oh, and still get stuff accomplished. Right. So, right. you know, like, <laughs> I could be like, well, I'm just not the type of guy to sit down and focus for five hours. It's like, well, but if I need to do that and otherwise I don't get paid, then that's a problem. Right. So, so it's, uh, it's just kind of like figuring out, you know, uh, what fits my personality and, and what's, what's my best uh, tact, like my best strategy. Yeah, it makes sense. And I think, you know, even when you're exposing yourself to chaos, it's like, there's still like the whole deep work aspect. So it's like still finding that time, putting on your calendar where you do your deep work, you work on your biggest needle right, movers right. and everything like that. And I think, um, you know, we basically never want to get rid of that. There should almost always be that time allocated for deep work. Um, but if you do that and it's like, you really focus on those needle movers, like, again, we generally find that we spend a lot of time adding things into our day to like feel like good about ourselves that we work 10 hours or 12 hours or whatever, but really it's like the important stuff could have been done in like three to five hours. Um, you know, and so a big thing there to be aware of is just like not feeling like you need to work really long days, but just feeling like you need to have really, um, like focused days, you know, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for the question, man. Awesome. Thanks guys. Yeah. Sweet. All right, so there's a great question here from John Caprani, although he's not on anymore, and people are asking us to answer it. So the question is, hey, Stefan and Ed, is there a daily schedule that you guys stick to doing things consistently at the same time? Do you guys switch between multiple projects in one day or allocate different days of the week, different buckets of deep work? And I have some answers for this as well. Well, then go ahead, Ed, since John's not uh, on anyway. You can go okay. ahead and start. Cool. And by the way, no, Luffy, that's not Eden. That's not Stefan's daughter on uh, outside in the balcony at the hotel right now. There's kids playing in the pool. And yeah, um, Eden is, I can't hear her, but I think she's about to go to the store with Laura. But, um, but that, yeah, that one wasn't Eden. <laughs> uh, so the way that I like to compartmentalize everything, so switch between multiple projects in one day. Uh, let's start at the macro level before we get to the micro level. Uh, so this is also what I told Jazz. Jazz, I'm sorry, I'm giving this to everybody as well. <laughs> uh, I love to compartmentalize my work into three things. So I only ever have three slots open for, for uh, any type of work. So I like to have, uh, as Ian Stanley calls it, money now, or a maintenance money, and money now and money later, ideally. Uh, so that means like money, which is just like pays your bills. So it's like, if it's like a retainer client or money, you know, you're, you're, you've already got uh, money now is money you're going to get in the next, you know, one to 30 days and money later is money you're going to get in the, the 30 to 60 or 30 to 90 days. So I like to have three different projects at once or up to three different projects, three different compartments in my head. So I will not take on a, uh, a client if those three compartments are maxed out. And this is completely fluid. I'm not saying, you know, you can't take on like a bunch of projects at once, but I like to stick to three, three big projects. And if there's like a lot of little stuff, like, you know, Facebook ads and then like consulting, that would be a, the third compartment. So for example, for me, uh, for a while, my one compartment was working for a client and then uh, one off sales letters. So this is like a retainer gig. So that's my maintenance money. And then there's one off gigs. And then I did a pure performance deal for traffic and funnels um, and pure royalties. So retainer, one and dones, and then performance-based. So it's riskier. Anything that doesn't fit in those categories, I don't do it. Or I adjust my schedule to make room for something, if that makes sense. Is that making sense? By the way, I don't know if that's like actually helpful or not. That's just me rambling. It's making sense to me. How about if it's making sense to you, put it in chat. And if it's not making sense, say, Ed, nope. Yep. Seems like it's making sense. Okay, cool. I wasn't sure. Yes. Um, and so from there, I never want to focus on more than three big activities every day. So for example, let's say you have a sales letter, right? So at the beginning of my week, I schedule out what the, what my entire week is going to look like. Uh, and then I break. So I list out all the things I want to get done that week. And then I take those big to-do lists, like the, those big projects, and I break it down into every single day for the next week. And I work on a little chunk of the project. 
uh, each day. So for example, if I want to write a new sales letter for a client, uh, let's say, you know, Monday, I want to, you know, write, do the research. And then Tuesday, I want to do the uh, mechanism of the brief. And then Wednesday, I want to do the day off. Maybe Thursday, I'll do like 50% of the copy. And then Friday, I'll do the last 50% of the copy. So that's an example. And then every day, you don't want to have more than three big tasks for the whole day. So though this is your 80-20, these are your, your big rocks. These are your things that are going to move the needle the most for the least amount of work and are going to make you the most money or whatever it happens to be. So pick three of the most important things for the day and do those three things first. Everything else other than that's a bonus. Uh, Stefan, you yeah. had anything? No, I mean, that's, I'm honestly pretty, pretty similar and pretty aligned with what Ed does. Um, the other part and then for me, I just have my reoccurring stuff. Like I really try, if something is going to be a regular meeting, I make it reoccurring. Like, right. I have this every Thursday at 10 Pacific time. I have a call every Wednesday at one 30. I have a call every Monday at uh one Like I still have my reoccurring things and then I'll look at my calendar and schedule around there. But to at this point, yeah, the way I look at it is like my big, yeah, my, my big needle movers. What are the couple of things that if I get these things done this week, I'm going to be really happy and they really move the needle and what's all the other stuff that I'd like to get done, right? And I, yeah, I do like an Eisenhower box. I look at like urgent, important, important, not urgent, blah, blah, blah. Um, but just having like that, like uh, understanding that helps a lot. Because like we sort of list out, like the problem is we're like, oh, I got to do 40 things. And then you like, don't, if you don't list them out and you don't like have them ordered and like have an order of operations and then you sort of like do some of them, but they're not the real needle movers. So then the big needle movers don't get done and you still feel anxious about it. Uh, you pick the wrong task. So it's like where you prioritize, like, you know, the order of importance for your tasks is just really important. That's a huge thing that um, I do too. I just find that you have a lot more time in each week than you think you do. It's just, you find ways to fill it with a bunch of shit that you don't actually need to be doing. Um, and it can be hard. I mean, again, other thing too is like, like even on Facebook, like I'm active on Facebook and I'm reading everyone's posts and I'm like looking at stuff and liking stuff. And then, you know, I do feedback and copy accelerator, which I need to do after this call. Um, but I, you know, I do that. I spend time doing that every day. Uh, but even Justin stuff and talk copy, it's like, I'm reading everybody's posts, but I, I'd want to comment and reply, but I'm like, if I just start doing that, that may, maybe I can't do that this week. I've got too much going on. Um, you know, or like emails that are not like actually that urgent. Like, so we have an urgency to want to reply to everything, but I really try to keep, um, you know, I, I just, if you've kind of tune out the things that can, you can come back to then like, great. Uh, so just really, yeah, I, I'm pretty on board with you though. Ed, and just like those kind of top things and, and the power of focus on a few tasks. Yeah. And also find out when your, uh, when your most productive time is like for me, it's in the mornings and with the exception of copy accelerator and these calls, I make a very strict rule to not take calls before 12, 12 PM, like noon or 1 PM. Cause that's my, that's my peak productivity time. Yeah. That's a really good one too. I'm, I'm also a morning person for productivity. Um, and again, my priorities have changed a little bit. I'm not writing as much copy. I still have, I have a couple of projects to tackle here in the next couple of weeks, but, um, uh, wait well, the next couple of months, but, um, like yesterday as an example, I had like the business insider interview at nine o'clock, which is awesome. Right. But I really had to make a game for that. Cause it's like this business, you know, business insider has got, gets a lot of coverage and really cool. Um, then I had, let me make sure I get this right. Oh yeah. The webinar I did of Justin at 10 o'clock. Um, then I had a call with um somebody at, at noon from 12 to 1 then a call with uh, my friend eli who's starting a health company at 1 from 1 to one thirty. then a call with the team of my supplement company from 1 30 to like 2 and then a second call for that from 2 to 2 30 and then from that point on i had the afternoon open to like write youtube scripts write retargeting for rmbc like all i want to do these youtube rmbc ads and people have sent me some um from rmbc method and i'm like, going to film them and I like started working on it and I just hit this mental wall and I got like cranky and my brain just straight up wasn't working. And I just basically gave up and stopped working for the day. But I tried for a while and I was, my brain was just fried. Right. Cause it was just so taxing between like this interview and then a webinar and then like meetings. And so, um, generally that's why I'll try to schedule that stuff in the afternoon as much as possible. Cause then I've already done my deep work in my writing and, and then I don't need to be like as, um, you know, it's easier to talk, but, but that's where I really try not to schedule calls in the morning. Just the same as you, I will pretty fiercely guard against it actually. 
Um, and by the way, Michael said business is either going to be video or written. That one's going to be uh, written, um, pretty sure. And then actually I'm positive. So that'll be a written one. And then the, uh, the list TV is a video one that will be on their actual, I'll be on the television uh, whenever that comes out. So, um, Ed, let's go on. Let's answer another question. All right. Well, Kimmy Du is not here, but she asked a great question. Uh, she asked, if you could go back, what's one thing you would tell your younger self? Mm. Do, you have a, do you have a good immediate answer? I want to definitely want to answer this one too, but I'm just curious if you have an immediate answer. Just what's enjoy up? the process. Like, don't be so hell bent on achieving everything. Everything's going to come with time. Appreciate the grind, appreciate the struggle, appreciate what you're going through because it's exactly what needs to be done. And if you can't enjoy the hike, how can you enjoy the view? So nice. I like that. By the way, what's up, Devin Yang? You said what up? And Billy Chad Espelo said, Can we ask here? Honestly, if you ask questions in the Facebook Live, I'm probably not gonna answer them there because like, you gotta be on the Zoom call. Um, but I forget to, yeah, I mean, I think like and there's a lot. Because on one hand, okay, there's a weird, a weird uh, tension for me between the fact that like this advice my dad gave me, which was that the cream tends to rise to the top, meaning that like sometimes we're really impatient um, and we're like, we want stuff to happen today, but like things will, if you put in the work and trust the process, you know, generally you will get the results. I guess the big thing for me would be like being process oriented, right? Like um, understanding that if you, again, the processes yield to predictable outcomes. It's the whole reason RMBC works. It's like a process. And if you follow the RMBC method and you like use that to write copy, you will consistently write better sales copy. It's like a predictable outcome that happens for RMBC. And I have, I don't know, like a thousand plus success stories at this point of people who have used RMBC and got in these predictable um, outcomes of better copy. And then there's other benefits that come from that too. At the same time, I mean, I wish I had, I was always pretty contrarian. Um, and so I mean, I wish I could tell myself to like embrace that contrarian nature more. And I, I wish somebody had, had given honored that more in me perhaps because rather than feeling like there was something wrong with me a lot you know i felt like there was like like i had something wrong with me because i didn't want to follow the status quo and i had this like crazy tension there um and not going these traditional paths and having a lot of people like looking at me as as being like you know maybe a failure add or whatever it is um and uh you know, thank God I, I finally just embraced my inner kind of like rebel and contrarian and went out and did my own stuff and get you know, my life dramatically better. So, you know, there's, there's basically, there's no right. I know I'm giving 10 answers and I'm kind of rambling, man, but like, I guess another thing would just be that there's, there's really no singular path to, to where you want to go. Right. There are processes and processes lead to like predictable outcomes, but there's also, there, there's no like one path that leads you somewhere. You don't have to go to college and get like a, you know, a graduate degree uh, in marketing to become a marketer, right? Most of you on this call know that. Um, and yeah, I talk with, like I always say, like I've had, I don't know why it always happens in Ubers, but I've been to so many Uber rides where they, they ask me, like the driver asked me what I do. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like I kind of do marketing and I'm an entrepreneur. I sell stuff. And they're always like, Oh, like, did you go to college for, you know, marketing? And I'm always like, no, I didn't. I studied philosophy and they're like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, I've thought about, it. I want to go do marketing, but I just don't have the time to go back to school. So you know, I, I guess I'll never be an entrepreneur really. And I'm like, how did you just have that crazy disconnect? Right? Like I literally just said, like, I didn't like study entrepreneurship or marketing. Um, but like I've had that conversation like 20 plus times and it's always just shocking to me. So, um, yeah. Yeah. People do hear what they want to hear jazz, but it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating when somebody's like, you tell them like the truth and then they just sort of like pretend they heard you, but they just repeat what they've, the story they've already been telling themselves in their head for like, you know, years and years and years. And this is just crazy shocking. Um, but when you get through to people, it's really helpful. And one of the most rewarding things about doing road to a billion and my email list and stuff. And I, and I did that email to my list saying, Hey, have I helped you get a win? And I got a lot of like, like wins, financial wins for people. But, um, a lot of people talk about mindset shifts, realizing that these things are possible for them in their lives. And that, honestly, that's like just as rewarding as like a lot of the financial stuff is when you hang around with like people on this call and in the chat or um, in these Facebook groups or you go to these events or whatever you do. Um, and you realize that like, you know, there's always people who are having success who are breaking through all these bullshit narratives that society tries to instill upon us and that we try to instill upon ourselves because of artificial beliefs that, you know, date back to our childhood. Um, 
when you see someone break through that, it's like one of the most exciting uh, and kind of fulfilling things that I, that I experienced in my life. Ed, more, more questions. Let's do it, excellent. We have a great question here from Dom. Dom asks, when you were writing for a client and the work has exceeded the current retainer, how would you go about restructuring a deal with a long time client like that? For the context, I'm an email copywriter for an e-commerce info product. What's up, Dom? How's it going? Dom, you there? Dude, I'm really sad if I can't hear you, Dom, because I wanted to know how to actually pronounce your name correctly. Hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank God. So first and most importantly, how do we pronounce your last name? All right. Uh, Charvelotti. Charvel. Wait, sorry. I'm say one more time. Charvelotti. Yep. You got it. Boom. Okay. Perfect. Now that we have that out of the way, which is incredibly important. Um, so yeah, you basically you've exceeded the current retainer and you want to restructure this deal. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they were actually, um, so I work with two other guys. Um, we have an agency and these were actually our first clients. Um, they came in, they were, you know, kind of on a smaller budget. Uh, they eventually left, then they came back and um, they're still at a point where they need more and more. And it's, it's hard to, cause you have, we have such a, it's become more of like a friendship at this point. Right. We don't come with them often and it's just hard. It's hard to move them up the ladder when sometimes they, it's just, the relationship now. What was the um? What was like the original scope then on your guys's end? Okay, so it was uh, we did like a welcome sequence, post purchase, you know, the general things. They're an e-commerce store, right? So basically, get uh, taking the new subscribers, converting them into buyers, and then um, getting them to buy upsells. Um, currently, they're trying to start like an info product along with that and then on top of that they're releasing like all these new product lines so instead of now it just being daily emails and broadcasts now it's like product launches so it's definitely not part of the current package yeah so you're so basically on the retainer aspect you were doing the daily emails and broadcast emails for them yeah that was like it was a pretty set defined scope yeah. um and with the product launches, like the new product launches, are you, you're doing sequences supporting the product launches? And then are they also wanting kind of like same thing, post-launch sequences, like, you know, follow-ups, like converting like people who didn't, you know, uh, get the product. And then even, are there going to be more like, uh, like autoresponders and broadcasts for those people too? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, I think it's reasonable to be candid with them on that though. I mean, that's a totally another venture and more like, you know, a lot more work as you know, and yeah, you're friends. And, but I think if you, you know, to me, like, I would just be like, you know, Hey, like I'm super excited to help you with this. Obviously this is a totally new venture and it you know, requires different work. So like, you know, I'm anticipating these are the additional hours that will be spent on this or the additional deliverables that are needed, you know, up front, And then these are the ongoing. So here's what the cost would be to help you with the, you know, each of these projects up front. And then here's what it would add to the retainer. Does that work for you guys? Um, you know, do you feel like, do you think maybe you're just like sort of are you, like hesitant to have that conversation because of the friendship aspect and you're sort of like, do you think that's why, do you think that's part of it? Or do you think they're going to say no? Well, yeah, I'm curious about where the, um, the concern about having that conversation comes from. So we actually had the conversation. It's just, I feel like we've kind of, dug herself into this little hole with them where they like what so they're they want these things we tell them how much it's going to cost and that because we've had this sort of candid conversation with them right um but they're afraid to it's sort of like this scarcity mindset sort of situation with them because there are sort of like friends now that's like they don't really uh, i would I mean, to speak candidly here, like maybe they really don't respect that. It's like the push of like, hey, this is going to cost this. We tell them. And then they're like, oh, like maybe we won't do that. We'll just do like regular broadcasts and promo uh, 
promo emails about it to the regular list and it's just like all right guys like yeah i mean i wonder if that though if this is almost like it's a whole like you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink thing you know um i mean i think you know you can definitely position it as like the roi and let them look at like you know realize what they've made with you already what kind of roi they've gotten why they should yeah but you say you've already kind of done that yeah we're like 58 percent of their sales yeah i mean at a certain point then i would just give up on them basically and be like but i wouldn't do more work i'd just be like all right well like look you know i think this makes a huge difference but you know if you're not ready to do it no problem and if you still need them as a retainer client then keep using them as a retainer client or you know uh, serving them as a retainer client um with within the the limited scope you already have um but you know you have to give up on people too it's kind of like what we just talked about honestly people who you tell them something but they only hear what they want to hear you know there's certain people maybe they're just not ready for this with you guys and like i don't personally like bending over backwards to try and if, it, if it's just not a fit it's not a fit and i'd rather just have a clean a clean no on it um and you know at a certain point they may change their mind on it but i mean that seems like the only real outcome to me i don't know do you think i'm right or do you think that does that no, i you're sort of confirming my own um beliefs here so it's really nice to hear it like you know, come out of, you know, someone like you, um, cause I respect, uh, I respect what you do and, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, really, I, I think that that's the, the outcome. And I see jazz agreeing in the chat too, but yeah, keep us posted how it goes, man. But I, but I really think otherwise it's going to be continue to be messy and stressful and it's gonna be a lot easier once it's just like a clean, like, like outcome, you know what I mean? Versus this up in the air outcome, like just having that clean sort of break and like, we do this for you. Great that stuff it's like talk to me if you're ready to do it in the future uh, and they'll probably respect you more longer term and may even you know hire you for some of it too but if they don't no big deal you can find other retainer clients to fill that void thank you Seth. cool happy to help um jazz i liked what you said though jazz said in the chat i avoid saving people people need to save themselves um uh yeah jazz said that jazz you said that to all panelists bro you've been dropping gold this whole time and then not realizing you were just doing it to on the Man. panelist jazz rookie mistake rookie. jazz has been dropping like little diamonds this whole time um it does but i agree just a quick note on that i mean like i i like giving people a chance to save themselves you know it's like i will totally throw out the the life like uh floaty thing whatever it's called the flotation device right yeah life like i'll, I'll throw out the flotation device and somebody who's like treading water i'll be like hey grab onto this and if they sort of don't, I may kind of like remind them about it one time, but then I move on because like I do, there's enough people who need saving who are actually willing to be saved that it's not worth my time to like, you know, it's more, I can help 10 people who want to be saved, but don't know how to be saved versus, you know, in the same time it would take me to like really win over one person who doesn't even want to be saved. Right. It's like a diminishing returns thing. It's like, I, I'm going to get way better return by helping people who actually are there. I mean, again, I, we can help them realize stuff for sure. Um, but like, and it's a challenge because it's frustrating when somebody just doesn't get it. But at the end of the day, again, it's like, I'll worry about those, like, I'm trying to reach a billion people. I'll worry about those people who are like really, really, really uh, don't think they, they, they want to be saved or like whatever. I'll worry about them later, but let's at least get the low hanging fruit. Let's get all the people who do know in their heart that they need to, something to change and are willing to do it, but they just don't know how to, they don't know the steps to take. They don't know how to grab out. And if I need to show them, hey, grab onto the flotation device and they start to do it, then I'll keep helping. And if they start to slip, I'll be like, no, hold it like this. And I'll pull in the rope and I'll do all this stuff, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I'd rather focus on those people for this time. And I think the same thing as, as like when you're serving uh, clients as well. Bye, Keisha, as well. Later, Keisha, Keisha. Ed Ray, we got about 15 minutes here. Let's, uh, All let's right. do some more, man. Next question. Unfortunately, Nico is not here anymore, but Nico asks, I'm launching my first offer next week and just wanted to say thanks for the guidance. I'll be looking to hire copywriters to write advertorials and VSL soon. Considering I'm not a copywriter by trade, how can I best prepare to hire, manage, and work with copywriters? What does a good working relationship look like between a copywriter and an offer owner? Damn, That's a, that is a good question. I mean, one thing I would say is hire through Copy Accelerator and, uh, you know, hi, the, the hire copywriter form we have, um, which we should put in the show notes because if you want to hire, it's like literally we have a thing where people can, clients fill out a form 
we put it into copy accelerator, but then a lot of the jobs aren't actually for maybe at a level. My mic just fell. <laughs> Not at a level for copy accelerator members. Um, but even when that happens, um, we will then add them to a copy accelerator light or we'll post them to Justin and Stefan talk copy or whatever it is. Um, as far as the relationship goes, Ed, do you have, I mean, I have thoughts, but I want to formulate them for a second. Do you have anything that immediately comes to your, uh, yeah. Um, it's funny cause I've worked on both the hiring end and on the freelance end. So I, I have a different perspective, I think. So do I though, which is what's interesting because I've hired a lot of copywriters. So yeah. That's what I'm trying to formulate in my mind. Like what do I actually look for when I'm hiring a copywriter? Cause it's like, I know that I'm reliable and like, I'm going to get things done when I sell me get them done. But most, I don't know, I, I've heard most cop like copywriters are apparently notorious for being late on everything. Fact, factual. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, you know, high touch point, like, Hey, how's it going? Can you update me? Like, you know, do your best to get that copywriter to update you on what they're working on when they're working on it. Like I do that automatically with my clients for the most part. Um, like whenever for you and Justin and Stefan, like I don't, I just go, Hey, here's your thing basically. Um, when it's ready, but for other clients, um, I'll be like, Hey, I'm doing the research now. Hey, I'm doing the brief now. Hey, I ran into this roadblock. Um, so do your best to, uh, invite an open communication and allow them to express any issues they have and like don't make them feel like by sharing a roadblock they have they feel like they're dumb or not happy or um like not a good copywriter because i know like sometimes like from, from a copywriter perspective it's like we're we're potentially sometimes scared to share oh hey i'm having a roadblock with this little bit can you can i can i ask you for help for this section um, but if you can be open with your, your, uh, people who you're hiring for, uh, being, and being okay with giving direct feedback, I think that'll help you a ton. Yeah, that's helpful. I've got, um, some more thoughts too, which by the way, real quick, uh, Noah said that Gerling, he implemented your Upwork strategy, uh, from Freelancer Freedom and he landed his first gig. So congratulations, no, on that. And Gerling, look at you changing lives. That is awesome. Um, some more thoughts I have. Like, okay, so at, where problems happen a lot is a misalignment of expectations. So one thing is having a really, really clear expectations of like, this is the project. Here are the outcomes I'm looking for. Here's like the deliverable I'm expecting. Here's what I want it to look like. Here's the timeline um, I'm expecting it to be, to, to receive it in and things like that. Um, and showing samples is really helpful too, right? If you're like, here are samples of other kind of similar funnels or projects or copy that I like, I would like, I'm expecting what you deliver to me to match like the tone and kind of style of these samples. Um, even stuff like in health, right? Like here are like the, I don't want you to use a made up story, you know, um, or like, I don't care if you made a made up story, whatever it is, right? But like, just all these things that are like really um, setting clear expectations before uh, they start is really important to me. Um, I think, yeah, you want the copywriter to be responsive. Uh, but I also think one who has, and this is, this, you listen to this if you're a freelancer too, it's really important. Um, I want my copywriter to have like confidence um, and like sort of have like the, give me the belief that they're going to get the project done without me needing to hold their hand. Like, yeah, like you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help as a freelancer or to ask a question. I think that's important. I still do that with clients all the time, but what I don't want is I don't want somebody who's um, kind of going to come in and ask me for my opinion of everything. Like, what do you think of this headline? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? It's like, I'm hiring you to be the expert to do this stuff. So I don't necessarily want you to come in and like ask me to make decisions across every single step of the like process or that becomes way more work for me. I'm trying to hire you to make my life easier and have less work. So if I feel like somebody's going to ask me like a ton of questions about everything they're doing and like need like constant feedback, um, that's kind of actually a bit of a red flag for me as well. Um, conversely to that, we don't want like arrogance either. If somebody comes in and they're so arrogant that you're trying to explain stuff to them, like what you need for the project and they're acting like they're not like listening. And they're just kind of like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Like, like, then it's like, all right, I'm also not really liking um, 
that as well. So I know that's kind of a lot, but the biggest thing that I see again, this issue is like not having a clearly defined scope of like, I'm expecting this deliverable. Here's the kind of samples. I'm expecting it to kind of look like this and match this. I'm expecting it in this timeline. Um, things like that are really important. One of the coolest things that the only person who's ever done this with me and I like was totally cool with it. And he, he, he and I laughed about it. Cause like, he was like, um, you know, this is what makes you different. Uh, is that Craig Clemens and I did a thing where we agreed upon an upfront amount for a letter I wrote for uh, him for going hippo. And then we did a thing where it was like, I got a bonus uh, if I turned in my work at the, by the timeline I had said I would turn it in by. So I quoted him like four weeks or whatever. And it was like, if I did in four weeks, I got an extra $5,000. But then if I, for every week after that, I was late. Um, it actually started detracting from like the total amount I got paid. And I even had to pay him back money if I was late. And he like proposed that because I proposed like that I wanted more money. And he's like, let's do it like that. And I was like, cool. And then he was like, well, what if I do it so that if you're behind the deadline, then like I start, you know, taking money away from you. And I was like, that's totally cool. I love it. It's a great mechanism. And like, I'll, you know, um, so you can even play around with fun stuff like that. I thought it was kind of fun to do it that way, but, um, hopefully that helps. And, uh, Ed, yeah, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Do it. Another great uh, question from actually, Ted Baker. Really answer it. How did it oh, turn cool. out? I honestly still don't really know, to be honest with you. I did a first version. It was for a, a big kind of guru person and it was converting, but then they wanted to do some different variants based on the person. And then I did those and I honestly don't know if the changes have ever gone live or not. Um, so yeah, I still don't really know. It's kind of a little frustrating, but it is what it is. I don't blame him like Craig for it. Their team just have a lot going on, you know? So yeah. Sorry, Ed. No problem. So next up, uh, we have Zacchaeus asking the question, would you recommend a newbie copywriter learn from two or more mentors, copywriting legends, or just focus on one at this stage of learning to attain the skill set, learning from the best in the game? I would, I'm just going to answer that one because I remember if we could Zach. Uh, yeah, I think like, I mean, it depends, right? So if, like Justin and I are technically two mentors. And if you join Coffee Accelerator, I certainly, I'm biased, but I think that's like, reasonable but we're also aligned in what we're teaching we're teaching the same systems right it's not like i use rmbc and justin uses xyzp and like you know we're like trying to teach both at the same time um you know we're pretty aligned but typically i would say to focus on one mentor at a time because i think otherwise you may get confused and be all over the place. I really think it's important to have one system and like, and one. So hopefully the mentor is teaching you like a replicable framework and a process and stuff like that. And assuming they are, I would use that one and master that one first. And then um, once you're done with that, then you can move over and try something else. Uh, I think that's the way to do it. Also, the other thing is when, when choosing a mentor or somebody to learn from, be sure that they're actually doing what they're teaching and they're not just teaching it because it, ma it makes them money. There's a lot of people in the copywriting space who have copywriting courses who are not actually copywriters and they're not getting paid to write copy for people. They just sell the course. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. there's a, like, I have trouble with that. Somebody was really hounding me about a mentor previously and like, you know, tell me who I should, you know, hire as my mentor. But it's like, dude, like I, it's a hard decision. It's hard. That's a lot of weight for me. And it's like, there's, and I don't even know, I'm sure there's other really good mentors out. I mean, you know, Kim Shalom, a lot of people have had great success with Kim. Uh, Dan Ferrari is a really good copy mentor. Uh, Fran Rangel will mentor people. He's a good copy mentor. David Deutsch will do it. And then of course, Copy Accelerator, the whole goal is like you get, you know, this sort of like uh, copy mentorship plus because you get the community um, access to like all the trainings, a ton of additional stuff. Plus you get RMBC in the framework. So that's why we like Copy Accelerator. But um. But then there's, I can think of people, I'm not gonna name names, but there's people I know who are copy mentors where it's like, yikes. Like one dude, like I, uh, eh, I'm not gonna say anything, but yeah, make sure, good, good advice, Ed, good advice. Uh, next question, same stream of thought is, how do you go about finding a business coach? Uh, I, would, I would like referrals. I guess we're doing rapid fire now and I'm not putting people on, yeah, but so rapid fire. anyway. Um, Referrals, talking to my network, leveraging my network, seeing who they've used in the past, what were their experiences like, what was their story, where were they when they started working with the business coach, where did they get when the business coach, by the time they're done working with the business coach, does that actually align with what your uh, goals are too? Um, and then having like a pre, you know, call interview with the business coach and making sure that your guys, your personalities align and it seems like a good fit. Um, those would be the biggest things. Also, 
though i mean don't be afraid to hire somebody who's a little different like i gave monique lindor a big shout out uh, on my facebook page because like she helped to coach me i hired her as a coach um two years ago and honestly uh you know she's like this like german chick who loves like yellow and only wears yellow and uh and like loves like pineapples and it's kind of like i don't know very different personality right and like imagine just like cheerful but kind of like severe at times like german woman like yelling at you and i'm like is this like a good fit but it was she was awesome she had these amazing systems and all this really cool stuff um but yeah and i do like coaches who have actually done stuff right because going back to like there's so many coaches out there there's there's always programs of make money as a coach and it's like you know just advertise yourself as a coach and get clients and coach them but it's like these dudes who were like an mlm and they sold vacuum cleaners before that and then they bought some fucking gurus course about coaching decided they're a coach and now they're out there like doing linkedin prospecting and hitting you up on facebook and trying to be like hey like do you would you benefit from a coach who can teach you a system and it's like you know like like fuck that like fuck those people don't hire those people there's nothing sketchier than um people who have no experience who are coaches who coach coaches on how to coach yeah as as ian has as will say yeah i um you know get someone who has like real experience man you know that's so important i'm not saying that's a bad thing to coach people who coach coaches but if you have experience then like don't hire them yeah oh man uh, john could probably say he loves when i get salty i do turns into salt bay i know i get salty every now and then but there's certain things that just piss me off jazz coordinates um, a spider-man meme <laughs> it's like the two spider-mans like pointing at each other in the right. <laughs> yeah yeah that's so good um, um what are your best tactics for beating controls um going through if it's a good control honestly going through and looking at big ideas, angles, hooks, things like that in the lead or in the first third of it that perhaps got buried that weren't used um, or that maybe could have been brought up higher. Um, little things like testing headlines, like providing new headlines that maybe you're going to hit harder if the headline is particularly weak. But really it's focusing on the headline and the lead and then moving up the big ideas as much as possible. Because like, again, there's a lot, even on good sales letters, there may be some really interesting curiosity driven things that just were kind of buried. So I'm looking for those alternative angles and doing that. And Peter Tesma said, what about being controls for ads? Honestly, same thing, kind of. Like even in an ad, maybe there's a big idea. Or, you know, if you the ad leads to a page, so on the page there may still be some like really interesting big ideas or angles or hooks that were buried that are there that aren't mentioned in the ad, but that may be way better. So even in a case like that, I'm trying to find like that buried stuff because there's buried stuff in almost every piece of copy that could have been like the lead. You got anything to add to that, Ed? You got spot on. Nice. Sweet. Okay. Well, Ed, look at this. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to end right on time. So, um, awesome. Thank you. Kim said the goal in these road to billion calls is so important to rinse and repeat on YouTube to absorb it all. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you everyone for attending, for joining. Love you all. Appreciate you all so much as always for all of you who are uh, coming to the, uh, the virtual copy accelerator event, September 10th and 11th really excited about that too. Obviously Ed will be there as well and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and a wonderful weekend as well. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Later.